stand with me and, and we'll read this together. It's, it's from Psalm 24, verses 1 through 4. Read with me. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. Praise God. Let's continue to worship him.
to read the scriptures as the paper cooperates with me. And it's going to be responsive reading. I'll read part of it, and then you will be joining in with me on part of it as well. verses 1 through 12. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy a long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Would you join me? Hear, Hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home, and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands, and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses, and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olives that you did not grow. Then, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Would you please join us in our prayer song, Feel free to stand and also I encourage you if you want to potentially special time with the Lord, come down to the altar if that's something for you.
are not built upon the shifting sand of the winds and blossoms of this world. Our lives are built upon the sure foundation of the rock, which is Jesus Christ, eternal Lord of God. We thank you for that, Lord. So when all, all around us is shaking, like the earthquake that happened a little while uh, ago, uh, the world shakes, but our foundation is upon you, and you hold us secure. Our Heavenly Father, as we go to prayer right now, as we look to you, we want to remember the, all the delegates, all the representatives, all the people helping with our general conference. Our mission is a global mission based on your great commandment to go into all the world. Thank you for the Free Methodist Church and how we seek to do that mission. Not just with words, but with action and with our resources. So bless all that happens there. May your spirit be the director. Especially bless uh, Anna and Carlos as, as their delegates, not only for us, but from our conference. And be with them and watch over them. And, and also Carlos's family as they're there. Lord, I want to thank you for Ralph, who at the live nativity said to me, I'm lost. And he started coming to church and he found Jesus. And now... He has had an operation on his knee and he's recovering down in Turtle Island. And he wrote me this morning and said he's looking for the day when he can sit beside Barbie, uh, over, over, or sit over by Barbie and worship and again worship the Lord in this congregation. Lord, be with him. Bring complete and swift healing to his body. Continue to help him to grow in his newfound faith in you. Thank you for Bill Baker and uh, his faithfulness to you over all these years. And now he finds himself in a situation he's not used to. He's been so healthy, but he's over at Highland, and, and he was in the hospital. And, uh, he's having trouble uh, walking and, and uh, staying on his feet. Doctors aren't sure what's going on. Help them to find out exactly what's wrong or bring healing, Lord Jesus. We ask for healing for his body so that he can go back home and live his normal life. For Eddie Summers, who's uh, also in a convalescent home, Lord Jesus. I just We just pray that you be with him and watch over him and also his family. Pray for Miss Ayla Medina, who, little Miss Ayla, uh, who has pneumonia right now. Lord, clear up his lungs and make him healthy and, and bless the Medina family, Lord Jesus. And also pray, Lord, for Crystal and her family as they uh, grieve for the loss of her brother, Justin. May your presence and your strength and your peace be with them and just bless them. And for Cowboy, as he seeks uh, uh, some uh, treatments for his daughter, Lord Jesus, may that all go well. And we have other ones that we're in prayer for. But Lord, we want to thank you for yesterday, for the great day of celebrating Esther. And bless the whole family, Lord, and help them as they go through a time of missing her. And we will miss her too. Bless this service with the enlightenment of your word and an application through the Spirit to each of our lives and our situations. And bless those who come to the altar and any special requests that they have, we pray in your holy name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Kids can come up for the kids' message.
And then he got really mad and hurt someone, he killed somebody, and he had to flee. He was a murderer. And then he went into the desert, and he had a good life marrying a wife, and God appeared to him in a burning bush. Really? Yeah, and told him, Moses, you've got to go back to Pharaoh and face him, and you've got to get all my Israelite people, you've got to lead them out of slavery into freedom. And then he did that. God showed his power. And then, rather than going to the promised land, they ended up in the wilderness. And God led them out of slavery into the wilderness. Well, they didn't believe God to enter the promised land, so they had to walk through the wilderness and learn to trust in God. Oh. I didn't know that before. Well, that's why I'm teaching you. I'm teaching you about Moses. What's the lesson to be learned? Well, the lesson is God saves us through Jesus, but sometimes things don't go right. And does your kids' lives go right all the time? Do you sometimes have problems? That's you go through the problems to learn to trust in God. So just trust in God and pray, and you can get through the problem. You have to trust Him every day, just like the people of Israel did. Oh, that's good. I'm learning to trust God every day. Like what? Well, when I got some food the other day, and one of my friends took it from me, I didn't bite him. I said, Lord, forgive them, and I look for more food. That's good. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. You need to forgive people if you're a Christian. I'm learning to forgive others like Jesus forgave me. That's great. Hey, kids, do you think Pat Brad is learning to be a Christian? Yeah. You are Christians too, aren't you? Yeah. You follow, and you obey the Lord, and you do what he tells you to do, okay? And sometimes life's not easy, is it? Sometimes things don't go the way you want them to, but just trust God to take care of you. That's what I learned from Moses. Moses was used by God in a great way because he trusted God and he listened to him. You do that too, okay? Thanks for listening to Kids' Message. Kids, you go to Kids' Church. great big production and they just think anything religious out there for the religious people will be nice around Easter time. That may be part of it, yeah, of why they showed it at Easter time. But you know what? Um, what they probably didn't know, I would hope they'd know this, but I doubt that they did, was the story of Moses. It's like a foreshadowing of Jesus because Moses is a type of savior leading the people of Israel out of, age, out of slavery. And uh, so, so in one sense, showing the story of Moses at Easter time is almost like a preparation for Easter. Now, I don't think Hollywood is that smart to figure that out. <laughs> Especially since, well, maybe since I just figured it out just a little while ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to complain about Moses. I'm going to watch Moses and watch the Ten Commandments. And actually, there's a lot of literary license in that uh, film, and some stuff's not accurate. But praise God that at least the story of Moses is getting out in our culture because our culture is becoming more and more illiterate when it comes to the Bible. 
So like when I share Jesus, I always have to ask myself, how far back do I need to go? And right, and, I, and, and lately, even like I did yesterday, you have to go back to the beginning to show what happened to mankind at the very beginning. If you want to show, share Jesus today, because people do not have background. A lot of the younger people have never been to Sunday school or Bible school. And uh, that's one of the things that we try to change here. We try to really have a good kids program and influence kids and teach them and form that background. Moses' life and his book, and even his books, follow a familiar pattern. It's kind of a seven stages for the spiritual path that we walk. It's the same as the pattern in the Bible in the lives of some of the fathers of our faith in Genesis. It's the same pattern that we see with the nation of Israel. And it is a pattern that we see in our own individual lives. It's kind of a story of mankind. What is this universal pattern? I've kind of got the seven steps up here. You may be born, or we as mankind, receive an incredible inheritance. We have this relationship or this covenant with God. And you're born uh, uh, with hopes that everything's going to be wonderful in your life. So we start out good, basically. Then evil enters and causes problems and separation of relationships with God and with other people. It could be our own evil decisions, like Jacob made some bad decisions, or evil that is upon us from others, like what happened with Joseph and his brothers in Potiphar. So evil enters and causes problems. Then there's a power struggle between good and evil. Satan and God, we are saved by God, and the covenant is restored. It's a new covenant. And then you think, well, okay, I'm saved. Everything should be good, right? No, there's an entering, entering into the wilderness. We go through the wilderness where we depend upon godly, upon God every day, daily. But God is with us, a cloud by day and the fire by night. And this world that we live in, in some ways, is an environment that is, is, is like the wilderness. That's part of this stage that we go through. So as soon as you become a believer and that power struggle between evil and good is over and you submit and you ask for forgiveness and you give your life to God, it doesn't, life doesn't all of a sudden become paradise. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like the promised land. We go through a wilderness time, wilderness of this life. Um, then eventually we, we through the, our growth in this life, in this wilderness time, we pass on that relationship that we've learned with God to our children and our grandchildren, and we enter the promised land, heaven. Then the process starts all over again, and our kids and grandchildren have to go through that process. So we see that pattern in the life of Moses. We also see it in the books that Moses wrote, the Torah. I'll talk about that a little bit later, the first four books of the Bible. And we see it in the history of Israel, in the story of Moses, these stages. Moses started out with the, in birth with a godly inheritance. He was born into a Hebrew family. Uh, here's his genealogy of where he comes from. And I preached on Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and I also preached on Joseph. But Moses' genealogy comes from, uh, comes through um, the uh, son of Jacob, Levi, the Levites were, later on through Moses, the priestly uh, class, and, and the reason they were is because of Moses. He was a prophet and a priest and, and a, a, a leader of Israel. So Le a Levite was Kohath, and then Amram uh, by Jochebed was, was the woman's name. And then, there, and then finally Moses in Zipporah. And uh, Moses had uh, a brother named Aaron, Aaron and a sister named Miriam and all of his family were incredible leaders and uh, uh, he married Zipporah I love saying that word <laughs> Zipporah how would you like to have your name be Zipporah well she was a Midianite but she was a, a, a but the, it was a Midianite clan that were relatives of, of, of Moses but they appeared to be worshippers of the one God and of course, we know the story. I'll tell the story in a bit of how he had an encounter with God. So Mo Moses was born into a godly inheritance. Then evil enters the story. 
Moses was born in an evil time. I've got to bring my Bible up here. I'm going to go get one from the pew down here. Or the chairs. Because I want to read, read this short section of Scripture that talks about this evil time that Moses was born in. It's from Exodus chapter 1, verses 6 through 13. Last week I preached on Joseph, so you, you know that story. If you don't, you can read about it. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. It's in the land of Goshen, the best land in Egypt, in the Del Nile Delta. That's what Joseph, that's what they were given. Then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in all their hard labor. The Egyptians used them ruthlessly. And then uh, you can keep reading the story of Moses in Exodus, uh, in the book of Exodus, first part of it. Um, but um, there's a picture of Egyptians making bricks. And the bricks were about four times the size of our bricks. And they made them out of mud. And a lot of the Egyptian um, works were not made out of stone. I mean, the stone ones have survived today. But most of what the Egyptians built was made out of these bricks. So they were put to work uh, as slaves because the Egyptians feared them, feared that they would... Um, that they would combine with one of their enemies and they would overthrow them, which had happened in the history of, history of Egypt. And so one of the things that they did after they started enslaving them, the next step they made, because the Israelites continued to be blessed by God, they continued to multiply in number. So what they did was they started killing all of the boys whenever they were born. And... Uh, you think, well, why did they just kill the boys? Well, the, it's because the women make better slaves, don't they? You women know that, don't you? <laughs> uh, no, it was because it's, maybe they do, but it's because the guys, the men, would enter war. And they didn't want to have any Israelite men, of course, to be warriors to overthrow them. So they killed all the men. Uh, horrible, horrible thing. Um, and, and it's interesting that when Satan, when, when, when Satan wanted to kill Jesus Christ, he killed all the kids and all the, the male children of Bethlehem, did he? We see things happening over and over and over in history. And it's, it's an incredible thing to see it. Um, so they killed him. They had no regard for life which belongs to God. Evil people want to have the power of life and death. Um, that's what evil does. It's all about power. Then Moses was saved by a boat made from a reed, basket, and pitch. Now the interesting thing about this, uh, the Bible was originally written in Hebrew. The word for this boat is exactly the same word as the Bible uses for Noah's Ark. So Noah, uh, the world was saved through a boat. And here, the savior of the Israelite people, Moses, also was saved by God in a boat. And just as uh, Moses, uh, who came out of the Israelite people, they had moved from Palestine, the Promised Land, to Egypt, so later on Jesus would flee to Egypt because the Scripture says, out of Egypt will come your salvation, just as it did uh, as Moses came out of Egypt. So we know the story, probably most of us, uh, 
ingenious. His parents wanted to save him, and so they put him in a boat, and, and I think they planned to have him be found by uh, some of the household of Pharaoh, and uh, Pharaoh's daughter did find him and uh, felt sorry for it, knew he was one of those Hebrew kids, probably didn't, I mean, who likes the idea of all the uh, children being killed if you're a mother or you're uh, a person like Pharaoh's daughter? They probably didn't care for that, but they couldn't do anything about it. But here she was able to save Moses and raise him in the palace. He was raised in Pharaoh's household. Now, here's where the real story is not really like the show Ten Commandments. Because even though he would have been a privileged adopted son of Pharaoh, uh, the household of Pharaoh was probably vast. Pharaoh had many uh, concubines, many wives, and Moses was not one of uh, two that was having this conflict with the son of Pharaoh from, from the time he was a child. That's how the story goes. Moses was probably on the lower rung of the totem pole, on the lower rung of, of those that were valued in Pharaoh's husband, uh, household and probably just ignored because there would have been many uh, children and many grandchildren and many daughters and many people in Pharaoh's household, many wives. But he did have these advantages as being part of Pharaoh's household, uh, which was not common in those days uh, to learn to read and write. He was, he was definitely uh, uh, taught to read and write, uh, probably more than one language. He learned the art of war, and he probably also learned more than one language. That was the training that was given in the king's household. Um, but one of the things that's probably very similar, and it comes out of Scripture to the story that we see, the Ten Commandments, is that he probably was struggling with his identity. He may not have looked exactly the same color as the Egyptians. They tend to be a little bit lighter uh, skinned, and he was sort of Hebrew and probably a little bit darker skinned, although there may have been some more dark uh, skinned people in the household too. He may not have looked up. He definitely was from a different race and culture, and they knew that, that he was from the, the slave race, the Hebrews. And, uh, and even though he was born into this heritage, he probably didn't know a lot about it because he was not schooled and, and, and raised uh, as soon as he was a child and he was no longer uh, suckling with his mother, he, was, he entered Pharaoh's household. So he probably didn't know a lot about his heritage. He may have known some. But, he, but, but they show him in the show struggling with his identity. And I think he probably really did struggle with his identity because here is his people that he came from in slavery and being killed. And he's living a, a really a life of luxury in the house of, of Pharaoh. Well, everything changed one day. He sees an Egyptian beating a slave, and so he murders the Egyptian. And that was not acceptable even for the children of Pharaoh. Pharaoh could probably get away with it, but his children couldn't, and his grandkids couldn't. Pharaoh hears about it, and he sends someone to kill him. Moses knows he's going to be executed, and so he flees to the area beyond Pharaoh's control, which he had to go all the way past the promised land in, or, or past Egypt into the desert, probably some area of Sinai Desert or around there someplace. And then he's, uh, he's destitute. It sounds a lot like the story of Jacob, doesn't it, where Jacob flees and he doesn't have anybody to help him. And, and uh, Moses is, is in, a, in a really bad place. And uh, he sees some shepherds, uh, uh, he sees a, a woman with some sheep and stuff and some shepherds that are uh, taking advantage of uh, and keeping the, the woman with her sheep away from the well. And he fights and defends them. Of course, he was raised and taught the art of warfare, so he was probably a considerable, he's a young man at that point, and he's probably a considerable, uh, considerable uh, fighter, soldier. He fights and defends them. And then he, uh, Zipporah, uh, comes home and tells her dad why she's home so soon. She didn't have to wait uh, all day long for everybody to finish before she could water her sheep. And she's brought in by Jethro. And Jethro 
was probably a worshiper of God. They didn't know much. They didn't know much about God, but the worshiper of uh, the God of Abraham. <laughs> And he's brought in and he marries Zipporah and things go relatively well for him finally. He settles in. The old life in Egypt was left behind. He's got a new wife. He's, he's, got, he's got a child. And, and things are going really well. Then one day, he's out and he sees a bush that's burning and yet it's not burned up. And he comes near. And he asks, and he hears a voice, and he asks, who are you? What is your name? Now, some people say that in that culture, when you ask someone God's name, that you're wanting to use their power. That may have been part of it. But I think in this instance, that's really not what's going on there. Um, Moses was probably aware that his ancestors worshipped one God, but he was raised in polytheistic Egypt, and he probably knew there were lots of demons masquerading as, as gods, and he was wondering, which God is this that's in this bush? Well, God responds with a couple statements. The first thing he says, he says, I'm your God. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm your God. And Moses still is wondering, well, who are you? What, what God are you? I, I, maybe you've heard about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, never had an encounter with him. What kind of God are you? Who are you really? What's your name? And, and um, how do you name someone from whom everything else is named? How, how does God explain who he is? He simply says, I am. I'm the, as the philosophers say, fancy words, I'm the ground of all being. I'm the one that everybody comes from. I am the one who always was, who is, and who is to come. Yahweh, that means I am in Hebrew. He says, well, okay, I'll, uh, I'll tell them that when they ask what you know, what your name is, I'll say, well, he just is. He's Yahweh. He's the one, one who is. So, Moses is struggling with his identity, and he asks God, who are you? And then God tells Moses who he is. He said, you are the one. Your name is Moses, which means drawn out. You, you were drawn out. You were saved. You were rescued for a reason. I am sending you to save my people. I have heard their cry. I'm not just this God who's way out there. I'm a God of mercy who hears the cries of, their, of his people. And, and I'm sending you to save them and you to talk to Pharaoh. And this is your purpose in life. This is who you are. He gives them his mission in life. Well, then we know the story. Of course, Moses tries to not do it by saying, well, I, I can't talk, you know. Well, he was, he was probably taught rhetoric in Egypt, and he's probably just saying, you know, speech is not my best subject. <laughs> Compared to the Egyptians, I'm nothing. But he probably was actually a pretty good speaker. He's just comparing himself to all the high rhetoric instruction of, of Pharaoh's court. And finally, uh, of course, God says, well, here comes your brother Aaron. And uh, he had sent Aaron, too. This was a divine appointment. He would sent him. And Aaron speaks for him. And when you look through the story, it's really kind of interesting. I've preached on this before. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But at the beginning, uh, Moses is not talking. Aaron is talking. And Moses is, is using his staff of power and doing all these miracles. And then during the story, some, it, it switches to where Moses is talking. And Aaron's not talking anymore. So his excuse didn't hold up. But there was a power encounter between evil and good, between God and Satan, between Moses and Pharaoh. And we know the story, all the plagues, which were really basically God saying, I'm going to take all the different gods of Egypt, one god's supposed to be of the Nile, another god's supposed to be of, of the of, 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 
life and death, another God is supposed to be the God of life and death, and another God is supposed to be the God of, of uh, provision, of, of, of uh, food. I mean, you've got all these gods, and I'm going to send a play, and I'm going to show you that I am the God of everything. I have power over every other God that you Egyptians think that, that has power. So he has all these plagues, and eventually, in fact, when, when God called Moses, he told him how it's all going to play out. You read this, the story. He says, this is going to happen, and Pharaoh's not going to listen to you, and then I'm going to lead you out. I'm going to show my power through this. And he does. There's a power encounter with evil. And uh, without any doubt, God comes out on top, and, and they lead the people out of the land of Egypt. And of course, they get ready to enter the promised land, but they don't have faith to overcome the giants there. And so God says, you've got some more learning to do. How about 40 years in the wilderness? Uh, your, your kids and your grandkids are going to see it, but you're not going to see it because you didn't exercise faith. You didn't remember what I did in Egypt. So 40 years in the wilderness symbolized by daily depending upon God, <clears throat> daily bread, the manna. Daily dependence upon God in this harsh environment, but God is with them in the cloud by day and the fire by night. Now finally, they're getting ready again to enter the promised land. And of course, in the meantime, they had, they had when they were given the law of God, and Moses uses this time to establish the nation of Israel under God's law. So there were a lot of developments happening during this time. They were growing in their relationship and their understanding of who God is. But Moses uh, got a little too big for his bridges. God had told him at one point in time that he was supposed to uh, speak to a rock and water would pour out. And instead, he uses the, the rod of power that he had given by God, and he strikes a rock instead of speaking. And maybe the first times that you read that and you reflect on it, you say, well, that seems like awfully harsh. But I think what it represents is that Moses had gotten to the place where he was depending upon the rod, his power, himself rather than God. God had blessed him so much Got a big head, and he started depending on himself. And that was God breaking him back down to say, you have to trust and depend upon me. And we see that that is definitely a temptation of those that are blessed by God. Remember the scripture that I read, that we read from Deuteronomy a little while ago? When things are really going good, that's the time you need to remember what God did, how he brought you out of that land of slavery. Don't think it's from something that you have done. It's God's grace. It's God's power. Keep that before you. And so the penalty for Moses was he was able to see the promised land, but he was not able to go into it. He wasn't able to go into the promised land. And the only ones, of course, that were able to go into it was the ones that had the faith, which was Joshua and Caleb, and the rest of the children of Israel didn't. And so before they go into the promised land, there's the book of Deuteronomy, which is they have to reestablish the covenant with the people of Israel. And that's what Deuteronomy is about. It's renewing of the covenant, the new instruction to the children. It's renewal of the covenant that God gave with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses. They finally enter the promised land as their forefathers uh, were promised. Now we see this spiritual pattern even not only in, in um, Israel, but in Moses' life. And we see this spiritual pattern that I talked about earlier, even in the books of Moses. First, there's the blessing and privilege that God has for mankind. We're born within the covenant of relationship with God. We see that in the book of Genesis, the story of, of how we were given privilege and you're born into a wonderful family. And then there's uh, the entrance of evil, like Adam and Eve. And then we see uh, the struggles that occur 
um, as we see the, the prophets and the great uh, fathers of the faith going through similar struggles that Moses uh, was in. We see sin entering and messing things up. So we see this, uh, this pattern. We see in Genesis the beginning and the blessing and the covenant. We see sin entering. Then in Exodus we see the story of salvation. We're saved by God. In the New Testament, Jesus himself, God himself, comes down to be our Savior and has a struggle with a power struggle with evil and triumphs. Leviticus is all about worship and fellowship with God. Um, intricate sacrifice system. It's not my cup of tea. I'm glad we don't do that anymore. But the heart of it was that they had this incredible uh, presence of God with them and they worshiped God and they respected Him. And there was provision for when we mess up for sin offerings to restore the, the fellowship with God. That's Leviticus. Numbers primarily talks about the wilderness experience. After you're saved, sometimes you go through a wilderness experience. Things don't happen the way you think they do it, did. You think God should be blessing you. But you're, maybe you go through a really hard time. You may even go through some times of doubt like the people of Israel uh, did. Life wasn't like you envisioned when you gave your life to Jesus. And then Deuteronomy is the restoration of the covenant and the passing down of the covenant to our kids and our grandchildren. And of course, there's entering the promised land, which we all look forward to. So I ask you an application. What has sin done in your relationship with God and others? It destroys relationships. It destroys families. The sin problem, the evil problem, has to be taken care of. There's a power encounter. And you choose who wins that encounter. If you give yourself over to God, you ask forgiveness, and you give yourself to God, God wins the power encounter. If you don't, you're going to be subject to the forces of evil in your life. So have you been saved? Has God come to you? Have you accepted the sacrifice and the reconciliation and the restoration that Jesus brings? He will, like Moses, He will restore your identity. When you give over uh, in your choices to evil, you lose your identity. You're absorbed in the identity of, e of the evil one. You lose who you are. God will restore your identity. He will teach you who he is, and he will teach you who you are in Christ. He will give you a mission in life. He's got a work for you to do, and you've got gifts that kind of help you to know what your mission is. Perhaps some today are in a wilderness time. We did what God wanted, but life does not seem to be fair. In fact, it's tough. And like the Egyptians, maybe you're complaining a little bit and you're looking back and you're thinking, you know, we had watermelon back in Egypt. When we gave ourselves to God, we expected dessert, not the desert. That's a joke. That's a problem. <laughs> Probably the only thing you'll remember from my sermon today. <laughs> Maybe you made some mistakes after King to Jesus and you had to pay for them and things, your life is just not what you in intended. Marriages can be that way too. You know, I we attended uh, uh, Michael and Kayla's wedding on Friday and then the next day the Embry family had the, the, same, the same goodbye party for Esther. Uh, uh, quite an up and down for them. But weddings are, are so idealistic and everything's beautiful and we say these vows to everybody and say, yeah, I promise I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do that. And oh, it's going to be so glorious, so wonderful. And it is. You know, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, the years I've had with Gene are great. But even the best of marriages, sometimes you go through wilderness experiences and things are kind of rough and, and uh, there's bickering and complaining and things are not going very well. That's life. That's why we have to have a daily, a daily dependence on the Lord. We have to have our daily bread. We have to stay in touch with God. And we have to get used to of taking the foot out of our mouth and asking forgiveness. You know, 
That's part of it. The wilderness experience is quite common in our families and in everything that we go through. Um, and then there comes a time, and hopefully that time is, is, is like Esther, where you've lived most of your life and you've learned some things. You've matured in the Lord. And your mission is to pass it on. But you know, when, when we first know Jesus, we already received that mission. We need to pass it on to everybody. But your mission is to pass it on to the other generations. And so like the book of Deuteronomy, it's interesting, but Leviticus has all these rules and rules and rules and rules. And Deuteronomy, when you look at it, is more based on general principles. That's where it says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And also, there's in Deuteronomy, we see, we teach people by the way that we live, when we lay down, when we stand up. It's not the rules so much. It's the principles of God's, uh, of God's word and, and God's uh, teaching. And as you get older, you realize that life's not based just on a multitude of rules. Life is based on living this faith and principles which are good for everybody. And that's part of the maturing process. And we see that in the book, in Moses' life, and in the book of Deuteronomy. It's an incredible book. And what, the reason Deuteronomy was written was to reestablish the covenant with the children of Israel as they entered the promised land. And we learn, like it says in Deuteronomy, that the purpose of life can be boiled down to two things. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others as you love yourselves. And that's the mission of our church. And then share that good news that God has come to restore our relationship with Him and our relationship with others. So no matter where you are in the journey of life, God promises, His covenant is, that He will be with you. He'll be a cloud in your day when things are going well, and He will be the light, the fire, at night when you go through the valley of the shadow of death. He will be there with you. And that's what we learn from the life of Moses. <clears throat> it's the stages of life. It's what we all are called to. Praise be to God. Take out your next step cards. And if you have a prayer request, I want you to take just a moment to write that down. We're going to give our tithes and offerings in just a moment. I want you to take just a moment to do that. If there's something that inspired you, you can write that down too. I like that feedback sometimes from the message. If you're interested in baptism or a small group or some other thing, there's a place there where you can write that down too. Let's just take a moment. Gene will play. The worship team's coming up. I want to give you a moment to fill that out. And if you want to, you can put that in the card along with your offering today. <laughs> Heavenly Father, for always being there for us, for giving us a wonderful heritage, for being with us when we had encounters with evil and saving us. For being with us when we go through those wilderness times. For helping us to pass down your love to our kids and our grandkids and for giving us the promised land 
thank you, Heavenly Father, for all of that. Bless us to your service that we might get your word, your good news out to everyone. Everyone has the right to hear the good news of, of Jesus and of an almighty, merciful, loving God who saves. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can be part of this. Bless this offering to that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please wait until after offering our worship team members will ask you to stand to finish the song. But let's sing together this beautiful old hymn of the faith.